Hi, I'm Logan Rogers, editor of Scott Snyder Presents Tales from the Cloakroom, Volume 2. You can find us on Linktree with the address TFCR2, and you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm JB Hawkins, editor and writer of Scott Snyder Presents Tales from the Cloakroom, Volume 2. You can find us on Instagram or Twitter at Cloakroom Comics, and you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by two amazing individuals. They are part of an amazing collective for Scott Snyder's Tales from the Cloakroom. If you haven't seen the interview I did with the amazing, talented people that put together Volume 1, please go ahead and take a look on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT media and find that amazing interview because it is really, uh, it was an incredible interview with four or five different and talented people. We have a new volume. We have a new batch of creative and talented people, which we will dive into in this particular interview, but we're joined by the ever talented Justin Hawkins and Logan Rogers. How are you both doing today? Doing well. Thank you. For those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Hi, uh, I'm Logan. I am a comic book writer and a playwright in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. And I am bringing today uh, Tales from the Cloakroom Volume 2, the second year student's anthology of creative works for Scott Snyder's Substack class with Our Best Jacket. Justin Hawkins here. I am a writer and editor in the new volume. I am kind of just thrilled to be a part of such a great comics community that Scott and and Tyler built in their Substack class. Like Logan said, it's a uh, it's really really great to to be do, doing things like this with really talented people. That was the one thing I loved about about Volume One was just the collective of different people and different stories uh, based off of a theme. It is actually the uh, the same. It's the same theme based on you know the jacket thing. How many how many times can you put a jacket into a story? Yeah, based on our best jacket. If you've got a cloak, a jacket, a windbreaker, anything like that. I mean, there's even one story where they did kind of some creative stuff with um, a dust jacket on a book. So, yeah, really, really cool stuff. Fancy. <laughs> That's awesome. How many people are working on this particular anthology this time around? So we have uh, 18 stories total, which means that there's about three or four people per story, though there is a little bit of overlap between letterers uh, across multiple stories. So doing the rough math, we'll just say it's about, oh, 40 to 50 writers, artists, letterers, colorists. And then there are the three editors. And then, of course, Scott and Tyler, who teach the class. So about a 60-ish little creative endeavor. As an editor, what was it like putting together this anthology and working with the talented and creative teams that put together their stories? It was really thrilling, actually, because we structured the submission process different than the first volume did. Where we actually did a series of feedback reviews where people submitted a pitch, we gave them feedback. They submitted draft one, they gave them feedback. Draft two was the final one they hand off to their artists. And so we got to watch people craft from first idea to the rougher first draft to a final, very professional issue they could hand off to their artist. And then from there, it was seeing the layouts and the art and the ink and the letters. So it was just sort of like watching a gestation process from you know, the wings and then offering what you could to help. Uh, but it was all about making sure that they could tell the best story that they could. And Justin, how about your your process as an editor and also as a writer? I'm, I'm sure you, you didn't edit yourself, did you? Uh, well, for me, the process of writing is also constantly editing. So <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of doing that as well. But from the editor's side, it was I wasn't there first. It was Logan and, and the other editor, Jason. And I saw that there were just two of them. I thought that they could use some help. I had some time that I could offer my help. And so, you know, I threw my hat in. And just like he described, it was amazing to see all of these stages. You know, I got to see it as a writer from my end, but seeing everybody's story, it was really incredible to be a part of something and got to see it unfold. As far as the writing side, I heard about the first volume really late. And I was really sad that I couldn't, you know, be in it. And so when when Logan 
reached out to to people in the class and wanted to start a second one. I just jumped on it, um, started my story. I think it was in uh, July, you know, wrote it in a couple of weeks. Uh, I finished it while I had COVID. <laughs> um, so that was great. And then, yeah, the process just kind of unfolded. Uh, the artist, uh, Nayara Rodriguez, she also did the cover of the the anthology, uh, was my artist. And she was so professional. She's from uh, Paraguay. So it's like this, you know, this, this, I don't know, like a world worldly thing. It was like a global endeavor. Because uh, Lyndon, my letterer, who is also lettering, um, he lettered in the first one. He's also a writer. And he lettered some some others in the volume two he um very professional he's from canada yeah. you know so it was just it was very uh, the best word is uh, joyful it was thrilling to to do this this is my my personal first published comic one that made it to like actual art and lettering everything else has just been a script it's been kind of a, a hobby of mine but i could never really afford to pay the artist or anything you know that, that's awesome i love it and and i'm gonna take a stab at this but it, i believe it was uh, lyndon radachenka Yes. He was on the show for his own Laundryman series yep. a couple of months back. So amazing. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Just incredible uh, talent for sure. And I'm glad that you got to work with uh, those talents, helping you make your first comic. I mean, that's got to be joyful from uh, for both of you from an editing standpoint. You're seeing progression. You're seeing an amazing class that I've heard nothing but great things about with Scott Snyder as well, too. From your uh, professional standpoint, what has Scott Snyder actually provided you in terms of, well, this class and, and what have you learned from it to make you a better professional in the comic industry? The biggest thing that I think I've learned from Scott is the ability to give yourself a license to make the story that you want to write and then to also encourage others to do the same and then to approach their material, especially as an editor from their eyes to the best of your ability so if you're not someone who enjoys romance comics but someone submits a romance story in that moment you must be the biggest fan of romance to be in their corner so that they can tell the best version of their story i'll parrot that another thing is um it's not only just kind of tips about writing uh, he also goes into the business side of the comics industry he has amazing guests like Greg Capullo, he had Donny Cates, he had Chip Zdarsky, um, Jock was like just randomly in our last class on world building. And then they ended up having like a 20 minute conversation about world building. It's just, it's amazing, not only to to get tips about writing in general, specifically for comics, but also just this knowledge from these heavy hitters in the comics field. It's great. That's the one thing that I think a lot of people, whether they're independent or part of uh, an actual publishing company, whether that's an independent creation or one of the big two or three or whatever, is the business side of things and the marketing side of things is something that a lot of people either are shy about or just don't have a, a, a basic grasp of what that actually entails. For sure. Running a Kickstarter, if you've never run one before, is like a second or third job. It is something that you definitely have to take a lot of time and effort towards. If this is your first Kickstarter campaign, how has that been for you? And what type of tiers and everything like that can we expect to help support this amazing project and series? You are so right that it is like having a second or third job with a Kickstarter uh, campaign. Luckily, we were able to get some more resources on that uh, end just because Scott has history doing that with other people. Um, first volume had, a, had an entire editorial team that did it successfully so we could talk to them about it. When I went to C2E2 to promo volume two and hand out uh, preview copies of the book, which are just like four story issue previews, 20 pages or such, um, there was an entire panel on doing Kickstarters that was indelible to the process and has been incredibly helpful in getting this successfully going. So to that end, the tiers that we offer are the basic digital ones. So there's the PDF of the book that you can get just by going on there that's the lowest one and there's the creator's edition pdf where you get the original book and we have the artisan sort of uh work in progress edition where people have submitted their pitches earlier drafts work in progress pages and then you can see sort of the gestation of the book the way the editorial did and it's there because the entire book was a product of the class so we thought having an archive of how it was taught and how we put the book together would be good for future teaching materials. 
Then on top of that, we have three amazing art prints. Two of them are the variant covers. One is by Matt Salisbury. Um, and then you can see all the artworks for that on the Kickstarter page. Then the uh, other options are stickers. Nayar Rodriguez, who did the main cover for it, gave us some wonderful stickers, cat uh, designs on them with some harkening back to volume one in the design. There are bookmarks you can add on there too. And then the editorial session where uh, that's the next highest tier where you can submit a page to 20 pages of story to JB or I, and we will give you a one-on-one -on -one feedback session on the story. And then there is the highest tier, which is the Scott Snyder tier, where you get your copy of the book signed by Scott Snyder. We have add-ons on there. You can choose which cover you want on the book. You can choose what goodies you want to add to your purchase at any tier, as long as it's physical, you're getting a physical copy of it. And yeah, I think that is the rundown on that. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the, the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? And this can be uh, maybe even from Scott Snyder himself or anyone else that comes to mind. We're going to have to go with the Neil Gaiman from the Make Good Art speech, where you only need two of three things to be a successful artist. One is to uh, be a joy to work with. The other is turn in good work. And the third is turn in good work on, uh, turn in work on time. You need only two of three of those to be successful. Or for me, it was, um, it was one of my college professors and it was really for academic writing and I've heard it from any writer really if you take a class or whatever it's just uh, keep writing keep doing it even if it sucks like <laughs> you know just keep on keep on writing what challenges do comic creators face in today's world that needs to be addressed accessibility I think into getting into the field because everyone these days is doing a kickstarter and indiegogo and I love that people are getting their work out there Love it, love it, love it. But I think, and Scott's kind of leading the charge on this with some other uh, big creators, but the move over to Substack, I think, is changing the game as far as getting comics to people, creating a new community where we're sharing it a lot more. Because unfortunately, these days, the big books that dominate the racks of the comic shop are going to be, you know, DC, Marvel, Image, and then a few of those offshoots. And then you have your local creators that might put books or zines out at your store but it's not quite as accessible to get everybody in there as it once was. You typically have to have some clout these days to get published. So I think Substack is going to be the game changer as far as sharing things with people and continuing people's careers in a sustainable way. I, he took my answer. So <laughs> accessibility, definitely, but knowing that there are avenues to create comics letting people know about that. For instance, uh, classes, this Discord was kind of a game changer for the class. It's what really built the community that was brought forth these these two volumes of Tales from the Cloakroom. And people share their stuff. Um, they share their Kickstarters. They share their, um, their shortcomings, I guess, or the things that really, really get to them if they're in writing funk. It's It's so positively reinforcing this discord so it's there are people out there who w would love to read your comics uh, there are people out there who um you know would love to draw your comics or write you know your the characters you have in your head that they're out there it's just knowing where to go i think so it's, it kind of gets into accessibility as well so so then what makes a good communication between a writer and an artist and an editor to put together a comic I think uh, first and foremost, the writer has to have a pretty clear view of the story they want to tell um, first and foremost. So you don't get off in the weeds of researching um, and uh, writer's block and things like that. I think a lot of people suffer from imposter syndrome anyway. <laughs> so like hamstringing yourself with some of these other things that you don't necessarily have to do as much um, for from a writing perspective, knowing that, knowing what story you want to tell and then being um being open to what the artist can do you know like knowing if your artist likes super detailed scripts or if they like to have a little bit more free freedom you know and what they're drawing um just communication really it's like knowing how to communicate with other people and being cordial and professional 
<laughs> I think that's really good. Uh, from all angles, artist, writer, editor, letterer, all of that stuff. I would add to that too, that editorial's main role in that before anything else starts is to communicate clearly to all parties involved what the uh, what the parameters are of the project, like page count, what they're looking for. The editorial editor's job from the offset is to tell them all the things they can and can't do to the best of their ability. So then the writer, artist, whoever can go off and shine with all their tools. Because sometimes the parameters are what is the pressure cooker to make a story great. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Reading Stephen King's The Stand in seventh grade. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, just because there are so many beautiful uh, extended series of prose in there. It mixes, you know, philosophy. It mixes just a really good story. It's horrific. It, there's romance in there. There's religious overtones in there. Uh, and it all does that in the guise of prose. And I remember just having, I mean, as an adult, I can and I can put it into words a little bit better now. But when I was 13, I was so overwhelmed by it. I was like, this guy did this whole thing just with words on a page. I was a reader before that point, but that was like kind of the revelatory moment where I realized that there was a lot more to reading and writing than just like, oh, J.R.R. Tolkien wrote The Hobbit uh, before I was born and I grew up, you know, hearing that read to me. Uh, for me, it was um, noticing the playfulness of language by Dr. Seuss, um, the rhyme schemes and the words that really didn't exist, but that totally worked, right? And that extended to uh, listening to to music and the rhymes of music and how powerful those can be. Uh, that's just what I remember early on. Music was my first love and I got into writing later, but that's that's really my first memory of how cool language could be was was Dr. Seuss <laughs> in, the, in the rhyme schemes and then in music, you know. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? As far as where I am editing and writing comics, uh, it's definitely Neil Gaiman. Uh, first time I read Sam Man, it just blew my mind. <laughs> That's my favorite comic ever. Uh, he's my favorite writer ever. Um, I read Sandman once a year, all the way through. Even the death volume and uh, all of that stuff. So <laughs> That's That's the one. To go to Guillermo del Toro for me because I got to see his uh, exhibit, the uh, Cabinet of Curiosities at Home with Monsters exhibit that he did that he traveled with for three different museums and the entire array of things that were both highbrow and lowbrow art and how he had these entire biographical swaths of how he could you know, very eloquently synthesize why the dumbest of the dumb and the smartest of the smart were all wonderful things for one to take uh, engagement with. From a professional standpoint, uh, this entire volume two of Tales from the Cloakroom is a success thanks to over 200% funded on Kickstarter. As of this recording, I'm sure that's going to rise way higher by the time the campaign eventually ends here as well too so from a professional standpoint you are both very successful do you consider yourself personally successful now that we have done this and the work of all of our wonderful writers and artists is indeed going to be out there in the world oh yes yes i most definitely do i yes 100 actually 200 percent yes yes um it was such a, it was so great to work with Logan and Jason, um, all of these wonderful people that are in this book. And even the people that worked in the last book that I've gotten a chance to, to meet, especially uh, some of the editors who honestly were integral <laughs> and like to, to the success of this one because they offered their wisdom and, you know, their experiences. So um, to get back to the question, yes, 200% personally successful. And then some. Yeah. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I take some deep breaths. <laughs> um, but, you know, I always go back to that second uh, wisest piece of advice and it's keep writing, but whatever it is, it's keep, keep doing, um, keep breathing, keep walking, you know, 
keep singing, keep writing. That's kind of what I tell myself, and it helps. I parrot that, but I would add an ice cream break, and then I usually go to the comic book shop and buy an absolute volume of something that I've always wanted to eat my feelings a little bit, and then I get right back to writing. The younger generation is looking at your work, your collective works, I should say, and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic book writer, an artist, an editor, or something creative in some way, shape, or form. Maybe Tales from the Cloakroom Volume 2 has inspired them in, on their path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Just keep up with uh, that. You're having a dialogue with the next people that are around you. If, if your job as the person who was swinging before is to help the next person swing, you do what you can to help them swing. And then if you are the one who's learning how to swing, you take your time to listen to the people who swung before. It's just a dialogue and you just keep on handing it over. It's all, all inclusive. Just keep on handing it down. Definitely. Um, I, I would say uh, another thing is to um, encourage the next generations to be honest in their art. Um, all, all of us go through things that we can relate to in different time periods. A lot of the times it's the same sorts of things that just keep getting repeated and repeated, right? But being honest um, in your art, uh, I think that's very inspiring. Just be honest in your art and continue to tell people that. And for me, it's, you know, I'll read something and that touches me and I'm like, well, okay, I need to do the same thing. I need to uh, come at something honestly, how I'm feeling in the world and, um, you know, not trying to sugarcoat anything or there's good times, but there's also, there's also bad times. So Led Zeppelin lyric for you. Sorry. Black dog, I believe. <laughs> good times, bad times. I still, that still bothers me with that, whatever it is, the, <laughs> was it the five, four time change or something like yes. that? In that first little bit, every time it just like, really? I, I know you're an amazing guitarist, but seriously, pick it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? <laughs> wow. The soundtrack to my life would be um, Abbey Road by the Beatles. And uh, the title to my life would be another song title uh, by Frank Sinatra called My Way. I have to go with I Bleed Coffee is the title, and then the soundtrack would be the soundtrack to The Crow, the original first one. Yes. Like one of the best movie soundtracks ever. Sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah no, I'll, I'll agree with bo both excellent choices, uh, and titles are very unique as well, too. I, I do like that. Well, Justin and Logan, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you both so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having us so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for letting us come on and, and promote all this work that all these great people are doing. Before I let you both go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we find this amazing campaign? Uh, when does it end? And any anything else you both would like to promote? At Cloakroom Comics is us on Twitter and Instagram. And then we have a link tree where it's just link tree slash TFCR number two to find everything. Kickstarter is all there. You can find everything on any of those links. And then as far as anything else to announce, it's just going to be, um, you know, shipping out the book and then celebrating a job well done for me. How about you, Justin? Same. Yeah. Kickstarter ends uh, June 25th or 26th. Um, one of those days. So we've got a little while. We're going to keep promoting um, and hopefully getting some more people interested in this book. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand, probably closer to 1,200 plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word T-O-W, not the number. That goes to a different website you don't want to go to, trust me. And of course, <laughs> the website's going through a revamp. You can go to our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than said website, which is, of course, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia, the podcast is back after 12 or so years because reasons and I am only one person, which you can find at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search for Two Geeks Talking on your favorite podcast streaming service that you listen to. 
And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.